morning with me, please. John chapter 15. If you were with us last week, we were looking at the 14th chapter, of course, and the key verse that we uh, tuned in on was verse 23 last week, 1423, where Jesus says, if a man will, any man will keep my commandments, my father and I, we will come to him and we will make our abode with him. We'll make him our mansions. Well, that promise of God, his abiding presence in the believer's life, this chapter 15 is about how God's abiding presence can really be experienced by you and me. And it involves both God and the believer mutually abiding in one another. He abides in us, and of course, chapter 15, we abide in him. The picture of a vineyard. It's a real familiar thing to Middle Eastern life. And Jesus uses it as an analogy and really offers a beautiful picture of the Christian life and its relationship to the Lord. I don't know if any of you have traveled up in the Finger Lake region of New York, but it's a beautiful area, especially this time of year. There are all these vineyards that uh, run alongside of the lakes, and it's, uh, it, it brings real light to this picture here before us. I am sure that as uh, chapter 14 ends, where Jesus says, arise, let us go thence. They leave the upper room, and they're headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, that's where they end up in chapter 17. I am sure that along that route, they walked by many vineyards. And so this is a perfect illustration, an analogy that, that uh, the Lord pulls together here in John chapter 15. So you have that chapter in your Bible open. I want to have a word of prayer, and then I want to review the six factors that relate to life in the vineyard. So let's pray first. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much that we can be here, and thank you for this wonderful chapter of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, hearts to understand, that we would take away from this passage today exactly what you want us to. May it have impact upon our lives. And Lord, may it put a desire in us to really abide in Christ. Give us understanding to what that means, how that's accomplished. And we just pray this all to the glory of Jesus, for we ask in his name. Amen. I should say, as we begin in verse 1 of 15, where Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. It is the vine that gives its life to the branches. And I want to begin by simply saying this. If you have never received Jesus as your personal Savior, if you're not saved, you don't have life. You have physical life, but you don't have God's life. You don't have spiritual life, and your need today is that you would once and for all be joined to the true vine, that you might have Christ's life in you, because when he comes to live in you, he remains in you forever, and uh, it's his life that pulsates through your human life, and that's what makes all the difference in our lives, and so Let's look at life in the vineyard here in this 15th chapter. And there's a, a record of six factors that I want to bring to your attention that I did so in the sale of time, but I want to review them perhaps in a little uh, more detail now. I just read verse one where Jesus says, I am the true vine. You know, this picture or analogy of a vine is nothing new to Jewish people. Back in the Tanakh or the Old Testament scriptures, the prophets compared the nation of Israel to God's special vine. And of course, 
when God planted this vine, he says he transplanted that vine out of Egypt, and he put them in that land that he promised them. And rather than bringing forth good grapes, the prophet says that Israel brought forth sour grapes. They brought forth grapes that were useless, that were of no value. And so God raised up another vine, and that is the true vine, and that is Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. He claims, I am the true vine in that first verse. And what he means is this, Jesus alone is the source of spiritual life. Spiritual life isn't found in anyone or anything else but him. He is the source of life, the true vine. And it's his life. And then look at that first verse again. He says, my father is the husband then, or the one that tends the vine, the vine dresser. The one that cultivates the life of the vine is said to be God, the heavenly father. And then in verses four and five, we read Jesus saying, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, no more can you except you abide in me. Now, this is not stated, but it's implied that there is the life of that true vine flowing through the branches to produce fruit. And that life in the vine is the sap, like sap in a tree. There's sap in a vine that uh, brings the life of that vine to the branches. And the sap implied the agent of life, if I could call him that, is none other than the Holy Spirit. He's the one that Jesus promised in John 14 and verse 16, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter. He will give you one just like me to stand alongside of you and he will abide with you forever. The spirit of truth who will not only dwell with you, but will be in you. That's all John 14. Well, that is the one who is the agent that distributes the life of the true vine, Jesus, the source, into the lives of the branches. And the branches here are none other than the believer. And the branches are the channels of the vine's life. Believers are the ones that are joined to the true vine through which the Holy Spirit brings that life into, Jesus' life. And then there is also, uh, fifthly, there is fruit that is mentioned here. In fact, notice verse 2. Uh, uh, he says, uh, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth or pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 5, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Do you see the progression there? In verse 2, fruit is mentioned. Also, more fruit. And then down in verse 5, much fruit. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Fruit is the evidence of the life that is in the branch. It's only when that branch begins to bear fruit that its life is really apparent, evident, manifested. And the fruit in this chapter is love. It's love for God. It's love for others. And that's uh, going to be clear as we look at it. And then the, the sixth factor that is stated here, and really what the chapter is about, is abiding. Abiding is the way that this life that is sourced in Jesus, the true vine, is accessed. We access his life, which is what bears the fruit, by abiding in the vine. And we see that again in verses 4 and 5 and other places as well. But uh, it simply means this, that 
fruit bearing is requiring that we remain or depend upon the Lord, who is the source of that life, it is this, that as we abide in Christ, we abound with fruit. That's the scenario here. And what we want to do with the rest of the time that we have this morning is talk about how do you abide? Because if we don't know how to abide, we'll never be fruitful believers. And so that's what we want to spend the time thinking about this morning. I just want to pause a moment and say this, that I believe that this is perhaps uh, the key chapter in the Gospel of John, because it is so basic to Christian living. Without understanding this abiding in Christ's truth, the Christian life doesn't really work, and it certainly doesn't make sense. And I also want to say this, I am uh, highly indebted to our friend and our brother, evangelist John Van Geldren, who has often taught these truths in various ways and uh, has been a tremendous help to me, to you, to all of us and many others. And uh, so I, I wanted to give that, uh, that credit where credit is due. But the way in which fruit is produced in our lives first of all, requires a proper focus. And I want you to see in the first three verses in particular that there is a special relationship that believers have with the person of the triune God, with not just Jesus, but also with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. We have to, if we're going to abide in Christ, by the way, the word abide appears a number of times in this 15th chapter. It's not always translated abide. Sometimes it's translated remain, but it's the same word in the original language. And so that's why this chapter is all about that. But to abide in Christ requires a particular focus. It requires a, can I say, a relationship with the triune God. For instance, in the first verse, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, he says, for the last of seven I am's that he claims in the Gospel of John, he says, I am the true vine. You remember the significance of that phrase, I am, of that wording? That can be traced all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, and I think it's verse 14 where God identifies himself to Moses at that burning bush as the great I am. And Jesus is claiming that very name for himself. It's the name that is often in the Old Testament, Yahweh, or we would say in English, Jehovah. It's that special covenant name for God that he has with his people Israel. And so this is the last claim I am, he says, the true vine. So the focus for abiding in Christ has to, of course, include the source of life, the Messiah, Jesus himself. But also in verse uh, 1 and 2, the father. He says, my father is the husband. My father is in charge of, of keeping the vineyard. He's the cultivator. He's the nourisher of the vineyard. In fact, verse 2 says, my father, every branch in me, every believer, you might say, that is joined to Jesus in this living union with him that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges or prunes it that it may bring forth more fruit. So here's the father. In order to abide, we have to be focused not only on Jesus, but we have to be focused on the Father because he is the cultivator of the vineyard. And he uses two methods to cultivate the vineyard, to make the vine fruitful. Will you note them with me? In the first part of verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he taketh away. This is how God deals with sin that hinders in the believer's life. 
it says, he taketh away. That particular phrase, taketh away, is one word in the original language, and it literally means to lift up. It means to lift up. It never means to cut it off. It means to lift it up. And I've read that uh, people that have vineyards and that keep vineyards tell us that the the vine sometimes grows down onto the ground and the branches get dirty and muddy uh, because of that. And so the vine dresser has to go through the vineyard with a bucket of water and uh, he has to wash the mud and the dirt off of those vines and lift them up out of the mud, out of the dirt, so that they're not hindered from uh, from growth by the dirt and the and the crud that gets on them. That's the picture here in the first part of verse 2. That's what our Father does. He lifts us. This is how he deals with sin that hinders us in bearing fruit in our Christian life. He, he washes us off. He cleanses us. In fact, Jesus says in verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He washes us off. He lifts us up out of the mud so that uh, we can then be in a position where we can be fruitful. And look at the second method of cultivation in the uh, second part of verse 2. He says, and every branch, every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, to purge or to prune a, a vine is a picture of how God deals with the self in us that hinders our fruitfulness. And that is this. When vine dressers at a certain type, at a certain point in the year, after the season is over, when fall comes around, they go around and they literally cut away a lot of the dead wood, the unnecessary growth and wood on that vine so that when the new season starts, uh, the sap will go as quickly and as unhindered as possible to the branch and to bear fruit. So he cuts away, ruthlessly cuts away all unnecessary wood. Did you know and do you realize that not only sin, but our self-life is more prevalent and hinders spiritual fruit in our lives more than we realize. And so God, he prunes us. And sometimes that pruning process is so painful and we feel it's all lost, but actually so much more will be gained as the Lord purges and, and prunes the self out of our life. And then there is the third person of this triune God that we need to focus on, not only the Messiah, Jesus, who's the source of life, and not only the Father, who is the cultivator of life, but the Spirit, who is the sap or the agent of life. And he's implied here as the agent who imparts Jesus' life, the true vine, into our lives because we're the branches. So focus on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are very important to understanding what it means to abide in Christ. You got that? Here's the second thing that I want you to know in order to aid you. And this is, this is key. Don't miss this. This is key. If you want to know how, as a believer, you abide in Christ, not only do you need the proper focus on the triune God, but the second F is you need faith. You need faith. And in verses 4 to 8, it's all about faith. The first three verses, all about focus. Verses 4 to 8, all about faith. And faith is our responsibility to live lives, listen to me, that are totally dependent on God, to live lives that are God-dependent. Look at verses 4 and 5. 
I want to see, I want to define for you, I want you to see the meaning of what Jesus was talking about when he said, abide in me. What's he mean by that? Abide in me. He says that in verse four and, uh, and verse five. He says, abide in me. What does he mean by that? He means, trust me. He means, exercise faith in me. He means, depend upon me. You see, you don't bear spiritual fruit by depending upon yourself. When you are self-dependent, when you are flesh-dependent, when you are trying through self-effort to live the Christian life, you will end up being fruitless. This is a command. There are two commands in these verses that we're looking at this morning. The first command is abide. Depend upon me is another way of putting it. That's a, in other words, if God commands us to do something, then we have a choice at that point. We can either say yes or no. We can either give heed to it or we can ignore it. But nevertheless, there's, there's the response of the believer is we are commanded to abide in him. We're commanded to depend upon him and not through self-effort try to live the Christian life. It is the choice that, that he's in us and we're in him. Abide in me is, is that uh, it's that I'm in Christ and then he in us, that is, we can trust him. He can enable us. If we depend upon him, he can enable us. We should depend upon the Holy Spirit to infuse in and through our lives the, the very life of the true vine of Jesus himself. That's what it means to abide in Christ, to depend upon the Holy Spirit to infuse in and through our lives the life of Christ so that the life that we live in these human bodies is not our lives, but it's Christ's life living through these bodies and these souls of ours. In fact, it's an absolute must that we abide and that we give heed to this command. Because notice what he says here in the, in the fourth verse. He says, if you don't, the branch can't bear fruit of itself. It's not a matter of self-effort. It's not a matter of flesh dependence. And he says in verse 5, for without me, ye can do a little bit. Absolutely nothing. You say, wait a minute. You know, I can teach a Sunday school class. Or I can sing a, a, a special. Or, you know, I can pass out uh, invitations to summer adventure. Yeah, you know what? If you do even that in self-effort, it's absolutely fruitless. It is absolutely fruitless. All that we do in order for it to be spiritually fruitful has to be done by trusting, depending upon the life of Jesus in us. It's a must. It's a must. It's a necessity because of the futility of flesh dependence. Spiritual ministry. Spiritual ministry demands spiritual power. And talented human ability can't do God's work. Can't. We'll never be fruitful in the eyes of the Lord unless we are depending upon God to bear that fruit through us. It's just as simple as that. It's a must. So that's the meaning. It's a must. What's the motive? Well, the motive is very clear. Uh, he says, if a man, verse 6, abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But in verses uh, 4 and 5, there is a positive motive here for fruit. And, and that is, of course, that our fruit is something that God commands and that God wants. In fact, in verse 8, it says that when we bear much fruit, we glorify God. And so there is a positive 
motive for bearing fruit. In fact, the only reason why you and I are called branches, the only reason that you and I exist is to be fruitful for the Lord. We're not here for ourselves. And it's not about us. It's all about bearing fruit to the glory of God. And so that's the one reason for our existence. That's the one reason for a branch. The only reason a branch is attached to a vine is so that that branch could bear the grapes, the fruit that the vine would produce through it. The only reason for our lives is that we would be spiritually fruitful. There's no other reason for our existence. The motive. And if we ignore this, if we don't abide, look at what verse 6 says. Here's neg we, negative waste, just a, a waste of life, a wasted life. Here's the aspect of a, of a Christian life who has not abided in the Lord. Yes, they go to heaven, but they have nothing to show for it. This, I think, is a parallel of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, beginning of verse 11 down through verse 15. Here's what, and I'm reading it. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, whether it uh, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall test every man's work of what kind it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It's a suffering of loss of reward. And uh, in a footnote in my Bible, it says, regarding that matter of a branch uh, being withered and burned. This refers to the works of the believer. The Christian who does not abide in Christ cannot do what pleases God. Therefore, his works will be burned at the judgment seat of Christ, though he himself will be saved. That's exactly what I believe Jesus is talking about here. You know, there was a book title a few years ago that became very popular, and the title of the book is Don't Waste Your Life. The way that believers waste their life is to ignore this concept of abiding in Christ, of being flesh-dependent, of trying to live the Christian life through self-effort instead of dependence upon the Spirit of God infusing in and through you, the very life of Jesus himself. Well, what are the marks of abiding in Christ? I mean, how does that evidence itself? What is the fruit that, uh, that uh, what is the abundant uh, fruit that comes? Well, there is an abundance, uh, more fruit, uh, he talks about. In that uh, fifth verse, he says, if you'll abide in him, you'll bring forth much fruit. That's one of the evidences. But look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You'll have answered prayer. What's another mark of abiding in Christ? Verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. You glorify the Heavenly Father through abiding in Christ and bringing forth fruit. And in that second part of verse 8, so shall you be my disciples. You'll prove yourself to be a true follower of Jesus. It's easy to say, I'm a follower of Jesus. But abiding in Christ is evident, is a mark that you truly are. The third thing that I want to show in this passage that answers the question, how to abide. Not only the focus, not only faith, but the third F is fruit, the fruit. And I want to specifically talk about the fruit. The fruit that is produced by the vine's life. The, 
the fruit, the spiritual fruit that comes into the branch life of the believer that depends upon the Spirit of God to produce Jesus' life through us. What is that fruit? It's very clearly, it's a manifestation of Christ's life in us. You know, you see the way Jesus lived his life in the three and a half years that he walked this earth? If you study the four Gospels, you'll see how Jesus lived his life. Well, guess what? The way he lived his life on this earth is the way that he wants to continue to live his life on this earth through you, through us, through, through believers. And so the fruit that is talked about here in this chapter on abiding in the true vine, the fruit of the vine is the Christ life in your life. It's Christ life manifest through your life. That's the fruit. How does that get displayed in the believer's life? What does it look like? What does Christ's life look like when it's displayed in the believer's life who depends, who abides in Christ? Two main ways. Look at verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue or abide. There's that same word, abide, is there translated continue. Abide ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. How is Jesus' life, the true vine, the source of our spiritual life, how is it manifested in our lives? Through the character of Jesus within us. And the character is love. That's what's uh, spoken of in those verses that I've just read for you. That Jesus' self-sacrificing love becomes evident in our lives. Nine times in verses 9 through 17, there is a mention of love. And two times, there is a mention of joy in verse 11, which really parallels the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. Remember what he says there? Now the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the second one is joy. And you see both of those mentioned, which means that when we abide in Christ, one way in which his life will be manifested through us, the branches connected to that true vine, is that the very character of Jesus himself will be stamped within us, and we will love as he loves. And we'll have his joy and not just human happiness in our lives. We'll have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, which is joy. And I'm convinced that of those nine fruits that are mentioned in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit, I really believe, because it's, it's a single and not a plural word, the fruit of the Spirit, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, and all other eight are manifestations, different manifestations of the fruit of love. That's the character of Jesus within. But there's a second way. There's a second way that when we abide in Jesus, his, the fruit is manifest in our life. And pick it up with me in verse 12. Or verse 13, he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In verse 12, he says, This is my commandment. Here's the second commandment, that you love one another. Not only abide, but now love one another. But notice this, as I have loved you. Well, that kicks it up a few notches, that we're to love one another as Jesus loves us. Wow, this is a human impossibility. We have to abide in the vine. There's no way that that fruit of love can be produced in us because we can't love like Jesus loves us unless we're depending upon him to produce his love 
through us, right? And so the second way in which the fruit is manifested in the life of the believer is not only the character of Jesus within, but the ministry of Jesus through you in loving one another. Read on. He says in verse 14, you're my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because the servant doesn't have a clue what his master wants. But the friend, he knows. And he says, all these things I have heard of my father and I've, I've clued you in. I've made them known unto you. Verse 16 is really a wonderful verse. When the disciples heard him say this, it must have thrilled their heart. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You know, back in the day when Jewish rabbis were uh, wanted to, to have followers, they didn't go around and say, hey, I want you, I want you, I want, but that's what Jesus did. Usually the norm was that these disciples would come to their favorite rabbi and would say, can I have the privilege of being your disciple? And uh, the rabbi would either take them or reject them. But Jesus, you remember, as he chose his disciples, he broke the norm, didn't he? And he called them specifically. And so it wasn't that they volunteered, but Jesus called them out and said, I want you. What confidence that puts in the hearts of these disciples, of Jesus' followers. And you know what? If you are a true believer, the Lord has chosen you to follow him. The Lord has chosen you so that you might be fruitful for him. The Lord has chosen you so that you might bring forth fruit that would glorify God himself. He wants to minister through you like he did through these disciples. He's chosen you and he has ordained you, as the scripture says, to go forth and bring forth fruit. That's God's ordination for you. And abiding in him will enable you to minister to people, to those around you, just like Jesus ministered to the people that were around him. It's like when you abide in Christ, you'll bear fruit and other people will be able to eat your fruit. That is, they'll be able to benefit from the spiritual fruitfulness in your life. It's like this. There is the inflow abiding in him, and then there is the outflow, love one another. And that's what these verses are all about. It's a command, again, to love one another. It's a choice, but it's not something you can do without accessing God's love. It's impossible for you to love one another as Jesus loved you. It's got to be his love in you and through you. His love abides in you. And when it does, it gets manifested in that you love one another. So abide in Christ to abound with fruit. That's the, the gist of the whole passage. And this is what God wants to produce in you and through you. And it happens when you and I partner with him by abiding in him by a God-dependent obedience. When he says, I no longer just call you my servants, you're now my friends. He's saying, hey, we're in partnership together here. You partner with me, and when you partner with me, you become fruitful. Because partnering with him means to abide in him. And that brings forth a fruitful life. I read about a farmer who planted uh, two trees. He planted one tree on one side of his field to screen against a, a landfill. And he planted another tree on the other side of his field, a little bit farther away, uh, that was by a nice, uh, cool stream. And uh, as the trees grew, they began to bear fruit. And the one that was closest to his house as he was sitting on the porch one day was the tree that he had planted as a screen against the, uh, the landfill. So he took a walk down there and he picked a, a piece of the fruit and he brought it home. He sat on his porch. He got out his knife and he 
and he cut a piece of the fruit. He looked at it. It was a bit deformed. And uh, he put a piece of the fruit in his mouth, and it was bitter. And uh, he threw the, the fruit out. Later that evening, he took a stroll down to the other tree by the mountain stream, and uh, he took a few pieces of fruit from that tree. And he began to eat a piece, and it was sweet, and it was delicious. And so he gathered more fruit to take home with him. The thought here is that the fruit was affected by where it grew. The fruit, the, the tree that grew by the landfill produced bitter fruit, but the, the tree that grew by the, the sweet, by, by, the, by the stream produced sweet fruit. Believers, you and I have a choice. We can either put down roots into the, the soil of the landfill of our fleshly efforts of our fleshly pursuits or into the cool, refreshing stream of the person of the Lord Jesus. And we have to understand that the root is what will produce the fruit. And the fruit of the believer is just the outward evidence of what we are really connected to and what we are really dependent upon. And I hope that today that you have a better understanding what it means to abide in Christ and that it would not simply remain as an intellectual understanding, but it would be something that would get translated into the way that you live the rest of this day and uh, the rest of the week and your life. Now, that doesn't mean that we always do this perfectly, but it means that we now have the basis whereby we can live differently. We can live holy lives. We can live victorious lives because it's not us doing it. It's not flesh dependence. It's not self-effort. It's us depending upon Jesus's life, and his life is holy, and his life is victorious, and his life is perfect. And every time we fully depend upon him, he produces that kind of fruit in and through us. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder this, this morning, have you ever been joined to the vine? Have you ever partaken of Jesus? Have you ever received him as your Savior? If you haven't, it's no coincidence that you're here this morning. It's no coincidence that you're tuned into uh, this message. It's God at work in your life, and he wants to save you. He wants to give you real life, more than just physical life. He wants to give you eternal life. And if you never trusted Jesus as your Savior, would you admit to him right now that you are a sinner and you are under his judgment and rightly so, you deserve it? But you would you say that Jesus took your punishment in your place for you as your substitute? He bore your sin, the Bible says, in himself up on that tree, on that cross. And if you will trust him and what he's done for you, he'll forgive your sin and he will become your savior and you will have eternal life and you will be forever joined, united with him, the true vine. And then your life can produce the kind of fruit that glorifies God. Until then, You'll perish. You'll perish. And any good works that you might uh, be able to point to are in the eyes of God totally worthless, totally refuse. And so if you're not saved this morning and the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to your heart about your spiritual need, I wonder, would you acknowledge that you need him by simply slipping your hand up. No, no one else is looking around. Just slip your hand up and take it back down. And in doing so, you'll acknowledge, yes, I need to be saved. I need to be joined to Jesus, that true vine. Anyone here at all that would just slip your hand up and take it back down and acknowledge in humility that's your need this morning? Okay. All right, then. If you're joined to the true vine, I'm wondering this morning, I'm wondering what kind of fruit is it 
good fruit? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Or is it the corrupt fruit of your good works and what you've been able to accomplish really apart from the Lord without depending upon Him? Do you do what you do? Is uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit? Or is it just human energy that you're exerting? What about the fruit of the Spirit, which is love? Is that being evidence? Is Do you love one another as Christ loved you? Has that become evident in your home? Among your your friends, your brethren, the fruit that only God can produce in you.